Board games, 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 board
there's going to be a year or two that this is basically just a bunch of gray plastic in the middle of the table. Exactly. I've had Blood Rage sitting on the shelf with like two clans and two monsters left to go for, I don't know, years. I just <laughs> finished most of Lord of the Rings, um, at least the core of the Lord of the Rings series in Middle Earth. Um, I've done a couple others here and there. Um, yeah, I like doing it, but I just don't have the time to do it more than once a week without angering the rest of my family. So. And that's totally fair. And to Log Saints, it's as lovely as always to see you pop in. So, yeah, let's... For me, actually, I never mentioned my recent highlights. And if you're watching, tell us what are some of your recent highlights. Did you manage to play anything in the past couple of days? Have you managed to eat anything nice if you've not managed to play anything? <laughs> I, I'm trying to... Yesterday... I did play a couple of games of Placeable, which I actually did on live stream, which is a solo hmm. game for DL deck. That's um, just a three by three grid. You're working on three letter words, and it is quite a simple game. But then I was like, okay, maybe I'm going to try this in French. And yeah, even though in English it was really a doddle for me, I'm just not. It was quite intense, even allowing myself to look up all the three letter words. It's pretty difficult, you know, in a mm -hmm. language that you don't really know that well. Um, <laughs> the New Year celebrations are continuing. Um, today, you're not meant to eat meat. If you want to join in the celebrations, then if you're not already vegetarian, then be sure to not eat I'm meat. trying to think if I've eaten any meat yet today. I think I already have had a little bit because it's already <laughs> 6 o'clock p.m. our time. So I've had a little bit. And the whole notion of when do you do it based on the day, it's kind of a weird one. Give, I mean, maybe you could do it tomorrow. Just make sure that you don't eat meat um, tomorrow. It I kind do of it for a day, no problem. Shows how... And hello, Rob, it is lovely to see you as well. Um, it shows how carnivorous the Iranians are. That It's like, okay, this special day, you're not allowed to eat anything that walks on the land. You're allowed to eat fish, though. So basically, it's there's this not um, today. It's just like no meat at all. But a few, uh, a couple of weeks ago, it was okay. Just you eat fish. You don't eat any meat or any birds. And I'm not gonna lie, there is a lot of. Um, but no, we had a um, special traditional meal with rice and. Um, you know, little pomegranate bits mm -hmm. and or dried up orange peel, um, which then Sounds gets good. soaked and mixed into a chicken. So, Oh, wow. Sounds good. For anyone who's just joining us, if you want to check out Brian Slattery of this Game Cafe, then all the links are where you, wherever you're watching on Instagram, YouTube or Twitch. And Ksate says, we got to the last level in the crew under sea wow. yesterday. The final level isn't playable for less than four players, though. Wow. Oh, that, that's strange. Yeah, that would surprise and not only sadden, that would surprise sadden and anger me. Yeah, would... especially you get that far, because if you've already played through the main one, it's 50 missions, right? I think we're stuck on like mission 11 no, or 12. No, um, this is the sequel. This is the, the, this sequel... Is the sequel, right? Yeah, yeah. But I'm assuming you probably played most of the main missions, then move on to the sequel. At least that's what I do. How like, many missions um, are in the sequel? I don't know. I think the sequel has fewer missions. I think it's like 35 or 40. But there's but more still. variability within each thing. But yeah, that's really rubbish. That, I mean, what does it say on the side of the box? Because, you know, the original one said three to five, and then two players was a variance inside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm really astonished. It's 32 missions in total. 32 and all. Um, played all of the crew and all of the extra content that was released as promo. Yeah, Xate is addicted to this game, by the way. Wow. And so, yeah, that that's... I am... You play with a group? I'm curious, is playing with a group of three or two or... Xate's playing yeah, with two just now. Two. In real life. <laughs> Not addicted. Yeah. <laughs> and... Hello, Johan. It is lovely to see you. And hello, John. Lovely to see you as well. I was actually hello. thinking about you because I've got something to send to you, but I need to, if you can help me work out um, suitable shipping methods. But yeah, that is, I am still stunned. I mean, what what's actually on the side of the box? 
Yeah, that's yeah, what they can't write, maybe it writes outside of the box, you know, 31 missions, two to five, one mission, four only. <laughs> that, I, I'm just still, that is, I, 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 I need to move on. Otherwise, I'd just be think I'll, yeah. I'm just aghast as, yeah, I am dismayed. I, I, I need a moment. That's disappointing. Especially mm. just one mission out of a whole batch. That's that doesn't make <laughs> a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, if you have any questionably quick questions, it is time for the questionably quick questions. So the first Woo! question that I always ask is, where exactly are you in as much detail as you're willing to share? I don't need your exact sure. street address, but, um, and what time is it here? I am in Glasgow, third story building, looking at a uh, gray sky, bits of darker gray, bits of lighter gray. It's very gray. And it is 10, 11. It is 6, 11 PM here in hot and humid Singapore. I'm on the 14th floor of my condo, looking out the back window, which I can see a whole bunch of other condos facing me. Um, if I was on the other side of the house, that's where we'd have a beautiful sunset about to hit in an hour, hour and a half or so. Um, let's see, this is kind of my home office. And I also have most of my board game collection up on the shelves over there. Um, and I have all the, the doors open. I don't have a Calyx because my, um, my partner doesn't want the games on display. So instead I have doors on my cabinets, but I can store most of what I need in there. So. As, so it just prefers it to be a blank white wall. So it kind of looks a bit neater rather than having all these colors. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind it being open. I used to have like a really large DVD collection, like 400, 500 some DVDs all in cases all lined up. This is 20 years ago, all lined up. Um, I just like the look of a collection and I would love to have that here, but. Singapore, a little bit of restricted space, as well as, like I said, a partner who would rather them not have my my geek flag flying so high. So we can close the doors and they, they look more acceptable that way. <laughs> it's, it's an interesting thing, whether to kind of hide everything or open it. I, I mean, it's, for some people it can be seen as, oh, it's a bit too much invasion of privacy. But I do really yeah. like the idea of just saying, you know what? Let's not have doors on anything. Let's just, yeah. um, <laughs> unless, you know, the front of the door has something useful like mirror on it. But right, let's, right, right. Let's, let's just see everything that's going on in there. Um, I don't mind having a bathroom door. I think that door I want to keep. That one's, I need some privacy there. But other than that. <laughs> but I was actually thinking of cupboards. I wasn't um, moving. <laughs> But, but you said all doors, so yeah, I did, I did, and um, that is a hundred percent true. And so, thanks for flat challenging me on that. Um, I like, yeah, I like doors sometimes. I am going to say that, if nothing else, for soundproofing, for kinds of sure. smell proofing, for he, uh, yeah, there yeah. You go. <laughs> but um, it is also very gray where you ruin is. Um, apparently, back to the crew, the side of the box says three to five, but the final mission has four specific mission cards to be distributed. And with two or three players, it's not doable as they limit each other. That is shame. How do we file a formal complaint? Mm. Hello, Rob. Rob says it is cool to open doors and find all the toys inside, like that moment of Absolutely. surprise and excitement. Would you agree with that? Yeah, like, so like I said, I work here too. And when I need like a break or just like 30 seconds to relax, I'll just kind of open the doors and like sit back and just, ah, yeah, I haven't played Blood Rage in a long time. You know, and close the doors back up again. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, wow. We're really Where getting we the in depth um, discussion on the crew. Okay. I'm, I'm actually curious. <laughs> so, apparently, yeah, uh, first... last, last played board games, I think. We haven't answered that one yet. Um, Talked about a little bit ago. That's from Johan. So I, mine are Marvel United, Takenoko with my daughter, Castles of Burgundy, Clank Legacy, Mariposas I just picked up. I taught my other daughter how to play Seven Wonders Duel, uh, Sleeping Gods, and Clank Legacy. Those are those are the ones I've been playing. Yeah. Um, so I'm just still reeling from um, Seat's things that, yeah, yeah, there is no way to do any two of these things. 
one, win no tricks at all, two, win exactly three tasks in a row, three, win two tasks in a row, but no exactly, more than two, yeah. four, win only the first and last tricks. Yeah, there is yeah, no way they're to... all mutually... Uh, yeah, they're all almost mutually exclusive, aren't they? I think they all are. Wow, that's rough. Yeah, that... Um... That, yeah, I, mm. anyway, so Bones John asks, what is the strangest encounter you have had with a person? All right, I've got, uh, I've got two really good celebrity encounters. Um, one of them is with Charlize Theron, where we were at a hotel and she happened to be staying at the same hotel. And we hung out with her in the kiddie pool for about two and a half hours. And she bought uh, my partner, drinks because it was her birthday so that was cool the fun wow. one though is i ran into conan o'brien in tokyo he was staying at, at my hotel i was there on a business trip he was staying in the same hotel and i had just come back from buying like a, a lemon meringue tart like a, a personal size lemon meringue tart and it was in a bag that i had like kind of clutched against my side here and in my other hand i had like my work bag and i had my computer open and i was holding my computer like in this hand because i was like busy writing a message or something. And I see him and I'm, like, I'm a fan. So I'm like, hey, Conan. And I like run over and I ask if I can take a selfie. And he's like, yeah, sure. So I'm trying to juggle all this stuff. I pull out my phone, I, I take the selfie. And then he looks over, he's like, oh, what's in the bag? And I'm like, oh, it's, it's a lemon meringue tart. You want a bite? And he kind of like looks down into the bag and he's like, no, I'm good. <laughs> that was that was about it for the encounter. <laughs> but I thought it was hilarious because Conan's whole brand of humor is like, you know, really awkward putting people in uncomfortable situations. And I kind of accidentally Conan Conan because <laughs> I didn't offer him the whole tart. I just offered him a bite. Like, what's he gonna do? Take a bite and put it back in the bag? I don't know. But it was pretty fun. <laughs> I mean, I would have. <laughs> I thought he would have too. Like, it's a perfect setup for him, but he didn't. <laughs> Um, <laughs> hello, Alex. It is lovely to see you. And um, Sate asks, talking about, yeah, let's, thank you, let's leave the crew. We can have a discussion about that on Friday and we can make it all about the crew. You can come over here and you can talk all about the crew on Friday. But what is the sound of your favorite color? This is, I think it's either. I think it's either angelic singing or psychotic laughter because my favorite color is yellow. So it's it's one or the other. Wow. Okay, and um, I'm going to ask, what's your strangest game that you've ever played? Oh, that's a good one. Um, that's what I wasn't ready for. I'm trying to think if I have any up here. Um, I mean, I'm assuming it's going to be some big thing from the 70s or 80s. Oh, I've got a bunch of those too. I have a whole bunch because I've been gaming since I was a kid. So my brothers, my brother brought me into the hobby and we had a whole bunch of weird like lie detector games and and strange things like that. Um, but actually one of the weirder ones I've been playing lately is a Singaporean game um, called Mooncake Master. It's by Daryl Chow, who also did um, uh, Remember Our Trip. He's co-designer of Remember Our Trip. And I don't know if you know what mooncakes are, but they're like a, mm. they're a traditional food that you eat in Singapore and in, in parts of China, um, like around uh, some different festivals, like the, the autumn festival. Um, it's not, it's a cake filled with like um, an egg, a salted egg yolk or different uh, toppings like that. And this game's kind of just a tile drafting game. You grab uh, three tiles, you keep one and you pass the other two to the players on your left and right. And then you have to assemble mooncakes and find people who are gonna eat them. Um, but mm -hmm. all of the characters who come out that want to come eat these mooncakes are very bizarre. Like there's like some guy in like a math shirt that has like all sorts of weird algebraic equations on it. There's um, one guy who's like clearly the foreigner of the group, like foreign to Singapore, it's like blonde hair, blue eyes, and looking quite rough. Um, and then there's like party dog, which is like the dog that has like a birthday hat on it. And there's a cat that does something weird as well. And they all have these really specific things they want out of their mooncakes, like what toppings and what flavors they have. And it's it's just weird when you're playing it, you don't really know what's going on, but you're just trying to assemble these mooncakes and score them for points. It's pretty good. 
Wow, that does sound really cool. Mooncake Master, you said that that game is. Yeah, Mooncake Master. I don't I don't know if it's really widely available outside of Singapore. But I'm assuming we... not, but if people <laughs> want to check it out on Board Game Geek, they can. Um, Alex mentions helping Keely Hawes and her daughter with a cello rental. Um, <laughs> and tuned Kevin Costner's guitar, although Kevin wasn't well, there, there at the time. And lots of love to you, Rowan. I'm sorry that you are going through frustrating times. And yeah, lots of love for that. And um, yeah, back to the questionably quick questions. I like to ask, books or podcasts? I'd have to say books. Um, honestly, it's YouTube videos. I, I watch a lot of YouTube videos. That's the real answer to the question. I've been reading a little bit again. It kind of comes and goes. Podcasts, I just, I'll choose a video, even though I'm often just listening to it, not really looking at the screen. That's just kind of my go to media. So, what's the last YouTube video you enjoyed? Uh, it was the one I was watching right before this, which was you interviewing Luke Hector. <laughs> <laughs> that was the last I was watching. Before that, I've been. Um, I've been doing a lot of, uh, I think it's playing board games, where they do a lot of um, Arkham Horror LCG content. Uh, so I'm really into that game, although I like have barely played it, and I own far too much compared to how much I've played. But I just like listening to those for like deck strategies and what they're building on that. That's okay, stream stretch. elements. There we go. There we go. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Apparently, I'm tall. I'm not. Well, <laughs> I didn't think I was Although, that tall. But... That, that's why it's great doing something like this, because we look like we're exactly the same height, sitting next mm. to each other in the video. You know, video actually, show. how tall are you? Uh, well, I was just at the doctor this morning, so 169.7 centimeters. But can we oh, just wow. round that up and say I'm 170? I feel much better that way. I am 170 as well. Oh, then we're the, we are the same, sitting or standing. There we go. There you go. It's just that I'm a wee bit closer to the camera, so my face is slightly bigger. Or maybe I just have a bigger head. Who knows? You might. I do have like a smaller head than than I probably should for the size of my body. So Wow. Um probably this is the tallest person we've got watching. 180, that's pretty <laughs> impressive. So thinking about books, and you say you've got this on and off again relationship with them. Yep. Are you more of a fiction person or more 100%. of a non-fiction? 100% fiction, yeah. Um, I just finished Red Rising because I read it after seeing Stonemeyer launch, launch the Red Rising game. I had no idea what it was. I didn't get Red Rising. I didn't think it really looked like the kind of game I'd enjoy, but I um, was curious enough to read the book. It's okay. <laughs> I don't know if you have any Red Rising fans. It was all right. Um, I've not read it. Read... So I'm assuming that Jamie's a big fan. He's a big fan. I guess he was chasing the IP for years and then finally got it and made a game out of it. Um, doesn't seem like it's super thematic of a game, besides the fact that it's got characters on the cards. But you know, it's kind of been that's kind of been how a lot of the Stonemaier games have been in the past couple. So um, I read mostly like murder mysteries, like a lot of Jeffrey Deaver. That's kind of the main the main one I read when there's one that's out that I haven't read, and I'm actually a couple books behind on that at the moment. Or rule books, but I don't think that counts. Um, so, murder mysteries, who do you prefer? Poirot? Mostly Deaver. Mo mostly Jeffrey Deaver. So that's um, Lincoln Rhyme. So there was a movie with Denzel Washington and Angelina Jolie back in the 90s, The Bone Collector. I don't know if you know that one, where he's like a quadriplegic detective like he's a forensics expert but he can't wow. do you know he can't go and and investigate crime scenes because he's quadriplegic so he basically stays in his um his flat in new york and his partner goes out and works the crime scenes so that's uh that's the one i read i am once 80 centimeters too around <laughs> <laughs> Good follow up. Um, yeah. So, oh my gosh. Yeah, people, you have the best anecdotes. In case anyone's wondering, Kate says, I once got made lunch by Bess. <laughs> um, 
I once made breakfast with Bez. Is this <laughs> weird? And was that in was that in Birmingham? Maybe before UK Games Expo. Talking about conventions, what what is the convention scene like in Singapore? Have you ever seen any board game conventions? I am unaware of any I, board game. No, I really there might be like a general like geek culture convention that happens once a year here or so. Obviously not right now. I'm not aware of any major board game conventions. I kind of joke about it with some of the, um, there's a couple, like a couple popular uh, content creators on um, on Twitch and on uh, Twitter, like, you know, three minute board games, all loves board games, um, mm -hmm. uh, Calvin up in Malaysia. You know, we kind of, private message each other about, hey, how do we actually get together for a convention and play or do something? We'd love there to be something like Essen, but in Asia, that mm. could kind of attract people from you know, a lot a of the Tokyo different countries game around. There's, there's a Tokyo one, but I, yeah, and I, I lived in Japan for a number of years. So that's one that's an option for me, but um, I'm not as much into the Japanese game scene besides like some stuff for Oink games and a, a couple of, of games there. And I just have a feeling that crowd would be different than kind of what I would love to see. Um, Singapore being like a central hub for Asia, and it has all the right demographics for being like a big gaming community. It just really hasn't taken off here as much as you might expect. Um, you know, I think it's more likely to go to one like in Australia um, or even New Zealand or something like that. There is a convention that happens up in Malaysia that I've been invited to, but I'll have to wait for the next one to actually happen. Then we'll see. Um, That's pretty cool. And the advantage of Malaysia is that it's going to be e cheaper to get to a place. Let's be honest. If you are yeah. living in Malaysia, one night in Singapore is going to be like 10 times as much as yeah. a night in Malaysia. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the travel and stuff around too, it's a lot of people don't realize how big Asia is, like from traveling to one country to another. Like if I go from here to Sydney, it's an eight hour flight. If I go from here to Tokyo, it's six and a half, seven hours. Malaysia is an hour, um, but you can bounce all over. You know, India's five and a half, uh, China's six, something like that. So um, it would be hard to get so many people flying such far distances, unless you already have a sizable convention going. Um, so it's, it's a bit difficult. I think there's still a long way to go for the board gaming community in Asia in general, like not counting Oceania, so not counting Australia, New Zealand. Um, still a long way for it to go to grow as a hobby. Um, and I think it's going to take a little bit more, you know, locally produced content, themes that are a little bit more relevant uh, to make it more popular here. But you can definitely see it's growing. Like there's plenty of game cafes popping up in Singapore. There's, you know, more than what you would expect in terms of game stores here. Um, but it could still go a long way. That's really cool. I've got to admit, when I went there, how long ago was it? Maybe five years ago? I wasn't seeking them out. I was basically just spending a bit of time with the family, having a couple of cycle mm. trips around. And I had, uh, I mean, I'm not going to call it a weekend because I wasn't working. I was basically, well, I'm not working for these two months. So I spent maybe a few days in, what's that Indonesian island that you can just get over the ferry from Singapore? It's um, Bintan? Yeah, I wanted to see. Yeah, that sounds. There's, there's one Bintan. There's another. I'm, I'm blanking on the other one. There's two. They both begin with a B. Yeah, I was going to say it began with a B, but I, um, <laughs> that doesn't help, I guess. I'm but, blanking right now too. <laughs> um, the other thing I went to JB Johor Bahru and cycled over there, which was nice. Just like get That's have cool. it buying. It's lovely how in Singapore, one thing about it, right, is that the government's decided, okay, bicycles are the future. We are going to give you cheap bicycles. If you want a bicycle, it's not going to be the best bicycle, but you can get a bicycle yeah. basically for the equivalent of 30 quid, right? Yeah, you yeah, can yeah. just go and yeah, get one of get these. It's going to be perfectly fine. And then I'll go across, go to Johor Bahru and just be able to cycle around and check how it's all the well there was only one as far as i know but check out the cat's cafe in johor bahru <laughs> yeah. you know spend a week there and enjoy the food there and then yeah. come back and then have someone telling me hey you can't cycle your bicycle here it's meant to be for cars and I was like, 
hey, wait a minute, it doesn't say that on the street. And then they say, okay, well, we're going to drive you away. And so um, then they got my bike and I was like, you know what, I'm actually heading off from Singapore in like two days anyway. It's been good having a chat with you because apparently these other people were forced to come by to pick me up from the side of the street so I wouldn't be illegally cycling where I wasn't meant to cycle, which was a bit strange. There's just this one big bridge connecting the two countries. Yeah, yeah. And then, yeah, I basically just gave them the bicycle and they were like, oh, thanks, I'll give that to my kid. And uh, <laughs> But, yeah, lots of love to everyone. And let's go for the rapid fire questions. Meeples or plastic figurines? Plastic figurines. Mm. Rules or art? What do you mean? Uh, which do I prefer? <laughs> which draws you in more? Which do you prefer? Yeah. Uh, I guess, well, the art draws me in. The art draws me in, but then the rules keep me in. Hmm. And, yeah, I was asymmetry or symmetry? Asymmetry. Okay, are you yeah. all about the variable setup? I, I love I love rules. variable setups. I love modular games where I can like swap things in and out. I love um, asymmetric player powers or divergent player powers. Like Blood Rage is my number one, um, and I just love how that you know breaks out where you start the same but then you develop differently. And finally, I would like to ask you to talk about your top one, two, maybe three board games. Um, so I do a top 100 every November, mostly for myself and also for the members of the cafe. Um, this past year, uh, no changes in my top three. So it was uh, Blood Rage is my number one, Viticulture is my number two, Seventh Continent is my number three. Um, I don't remember what four and five are. I know five is unmatched. <laughs> so for those who are four is Eldritch Horror. With four is Eldritch. Um, Blood Rage, that's a... It's a weird one. It's very much a kind of Euro drafty game. It's got quite a lot of thoughtfulness behind it. And then it's got, boom, these big miniatures. Big and team. from Eric Lang's Cool Mini or Not. Um, yeah. What draws you in? Is it that? <laughs> Blood Rage, first time I played it, I loved it. Um, it was just a lot of fun. It, it like immediately jumped into like my top five. And then um, I actually got to play it with Eric Lang at our cafe. So he used to live here in Singapore and um, one of my game gurus. So at the game cafe, we have like a, a volunteer group of about eight of us who kind of manage and run to the cafe. One of them got transferred to move to the US and his favorite game is Blood Rage. And I had been kind of trying to message Eric and become friends with him for a while and then um, my friend was leaving. And so I, I messaged him, finally got through to him and said like, hey, can you come to the cafe as like a surprise guest and sit down and play the game you designed with a friend of mine who it's his favorite wow. game of all time. And so um, he agreed, uh, very graceful of him. Um, and then he showed up and like I told my friend, hey, just wait a minute, I gotta go get someone. So I left and he thought I was going to bring back another friend who had worked at the company, but uh, left a couple months earlier. And so I walk up and there's Eric and um, my friend was just absolutely stunned. He's just like, he couldn't pick his job off the floor. And Eric was really cool. He brought a couple other games that he had designed and he donated them to the cafe, signed boxes for us, then proceeded to beat us all by like 150 points in blood rage. It wasn't even close. Um, and then, yeah, we actually just became friends after that. So I, I managed to hang out with him a number of times um, before he left Singapore, moved back to Canada. Uh, we still chat several times a week. Um, I've helped him out with some play testing here and there. Uh, so yeah, it was just really cool. Um, but I think that experience kind of bumped it up to number one, just because it, it's kind of special when you get to play a, a game like that with the designer. So it, it's held its top spot. That sounds phenomenal. And yeah, Eric's such a cool person. And oh, he's yeah, really amazing. He's just so amazing. Like I, I've, yeah. And I've just, not only as a game designer, right, but just as a person in general, like um, mm. I've learned so much from him in like the past couple of years, just in terms of, um, you know, all, all the good 
social things he does, like for, you know, protecting the rights of other people and, and how he's just, open, you know, pushing diversity and fighting for diversity in the, in the gaming community. And it's been really important for me because, um, you know, just running the cafe as well. I try to make it as open and inclusive and diverse as possible. And I've been learning a lot. Like when we get back to the cafe, there's like a number of games that I'm, I'm going to call from the collection just because I don't think they're as representative as I want them to be for mm -hmm. the community or they're touching on themes that are more sensitive than you know what I'd like. Things that you know, I wasn't really as aware of um, a couple of years ago, but I've become aware of or you know, am a lot more mindful about how they might impact um, members of our gaming community that we have. And that's just, you know, not not the community I want to run at the cafe. So uh, yeah, there'll be a couple, I won't necessarily name them, uh, but there are a couple of games that yeah, they're yeah. going to get yanked out of there. No, great stuff. And I think it's really good when you are in a position to have, look, it's not the world's biggest board game cafe, not even close, but you know, you st within this company that you work for, you've still got 750 people that have popped in and maybe even by seeing one of these games on the shelf, it does lead to that sense of normalization of a possibly problematic subject matter. So I think that's yeah, I mean, even really awesome. like even, okay, like even we've got Secret Hitler in the cafe, right? And it's, you know, one of the most popular social deduction games out there. It's, you know, loved by a lot of members in our cafe. It's, it's one of our more played games, but um, you know, I've had German colleagues who've walked by, looked at the shelf and been like, oh, like, what is that? Like people who are not in the gaming community, right? Um, and, you know, even just having that on the shelf is, it's not great, right? I mean, if you've played the game, you know that, hey, thematically, it's it's part of the game for sure, but it's not, um, you know, like championing Hitler or anything like that. But I've, I've sat there and seen people play games of it at game cafes where it did get a bit over the line. Um, so that's one that, you know, I'll probably replace when when we get back to the cafe. Um, I wish there was another game that did it just as well because social deduction and those kind of like, um, you know, about an eight player party-ish game that takes like 20 minutes to 30 minutes. That's really a sweet spot because we have a lot of teams that come I mean, down and play. One that's Ultimate Werewolf? Can be, it's, it's a bit, uh, Ultimate Werewolf in particular is a bit difficult here because you need the app. And the app um, in Singapore is not always a free download. <laughs> like sometimes it's people have to pay for it, so that that's not the best. Um, we have Deception, Murder in Hong Kong. That one goes well. Um, Bang the Dice game is popular. If once you sit people down and teach it, uh, Code Names, Code Name Pictures are our top two. Um, Sushi Go Party. We've got you know a lot of party games for eight that are good. Two Rooms and Boom. Yeah, we have that one as well. Um, that's a good one, but it takes, it definitely takes a lot of teaching and you have to physically separate people, which we can do because of the way that the cafe is constructed. We have like a perfect hallway where we can have half the group sit on one end of the hallway and the other half in the other. And then normally myself or one of the other game gurus will moderate and run in between and kind of help out. Um, but it takes structure. Um, and we like to have a lot of games that people can pick up off the shelf and play with them um, without us having to teach every step of the way. Um, mm. and you know, there are a lot of games like people know secret Hitler and people know, um, a lot of those and they can just pull them off the shelf and teach them to their friends or play with their friends without us getting involved. So I find it helps. quite a shame that people feel like one night's ultimate werewolf or daybreak or vampire needs the app because they don't. I mean, for hmm. one night's ultimate alien. Yes, you absolutely need the app because that's an integral oh, that's component. Good. It's got like I didn't know that. But in terms of the app, like I basically never use the app for One Night Ultimate Werewolf or One Night Ultimate Werewolf Daybreak. You as a mo you do need to then have a moderator. But what you can do to make it easier for the moderator is say, well, in between other people put out the tokens in the order mm -hmm. that they're going to be called, in between other people doing the things. You can quickly flash open your eyes, gaze at the things, and just say, oh, yeah, that's the next one, in case you forgot. And so as long as your eyes aren't open when you're asking other people's eyes to be open, it's all good. Right, right, right. And, um, yeah, Resistance Avalon or just... 
Avalon's Post big. Time. Yeah. Yeah. Avalon people play a lot of that's, that's a winner. Um, as well as like, uh, Spyfall can be a hit. Um, and fake artist goes to New York, which is Spyfall with drawing. <laughs> it's the same thing. Um, that one can go over pretty well as well to the fact that we have like a bunch of pads of paper that we just keep next to that game and we keep it as a record. So people will just walk up and like flip through and see what other people have done. And we have a way that we have people sign it, like sign what the picture was, what people guessed, if the spy got caught or not. And so people will flip through and kind of leave their own mementos there in the cafe. That's pretty cool. That sounds amazing. I just want to, um, before we finish up the questionably quick questions, just talk about Viticulture for a moment. This is Jamie Stegmeier's second Kickstarter, I believe. Yeah. Um, first Maybe game. his first. I think it was his first game. Second Kickstarter. It was his first ever. game, know. second Kickstarter. Ah, okay. Yeah, first game. Yeah, that one, um, that's been a favorite of mine since I first got it. It's my favorite worker place mix. It's my number two. Um, favorite place to play it is at a vineyard in Sydney. So I, I've uh, taken it twice now with me on vacation to a little farmhouse. We go to it's on a vineyard in Sydney. I played it with my with my partner and my mom, who was 76, 77, something like that at the time. Um, she didn't really get it, but we finished. Uh, and then I went back to that same vineyard with some other friends of ours from Singapore. We took a, a family trip there and I, we played it like every night for like a week. Um, and I think I've won every game I've played in that four. So, so they keep trying to beat me um, to the point where now I, they don't really want to play it that much anymore because they, they always lose. Um, that's one of the only games that I think I'm like good at. Like I'm fairly confident in my viticulture skill or just the, the pacing of it sings to me. For anyone who hasn't who hasn't played it or doesn't know what it is, it's a uh, worker placement game, like two to five players, I think, maybe two to six players, where you're actually building up your own vineyard, growing mm. your own wine, and then selling it off. Um, that's really good, and it, but there is a pace to it. Like you have to know when you need to have things up and running. There's a lot of timing elements to get your vineyard like working and then uh, hit your points at the right amount of time to be able to score enough to win. Um, yeah, that's that's a good one. I really like. And you've got stories about playing Blood Rage with Eric Lang, playing Viticulture yep. in a vineyard. And can yep. you remind me what the third <laughs> game was that you mentioned? Uh, third one, Seventh Continent. Seventh Continent. Seventh so this Continent. is the one of the three that I've not actually played myself. I know it's like very much narrative driven, and it's a big sprawling game. Tell us a wee yeah. bit about what draws you to it light narrative um it, it does play kind of like one of those old choose your own adventure books um where you start out with just a card on a map and you get told like the the narrative is always on the back of one card so a very very small amount of narrative and the story kind of emerges as you play you kind of create your own story so you'll start in the middle of this island and you have to lift a curse and if you don't lift the curse by the end of the game you're dead uh you're probably gonna die anyway because it's <laughs> it's not an easy game to win at first and then you just basically make a choice. Like, do I want to go you know, up, down, left, right, north, south, east, west? And sometimes there'll be something on a card that you can interact with. Like, oh, there's, you know, there's a seagull over there that looks dead on the ground. Do you want to go inspect the seagull? And then you draw cards from the deck, which is also your life force. Um, and you need to draw a certain number of successes. But each card has a double use, where one part of the card, like a third of the card, shows how many successes. And you draw a certain number. If you pass the number, the threshold needed, you pass the test. If not, you take a failure, which is going to be something terrible that happens to you, like you're you're bloody or you're poisoned or whatever. Um, and then you also get to keep one of the cards, which has either some kind of skill or some kind of a tool. Like, so you might get a club and then you can use that club and equip it and then use that to go fight other things as you go on. And it's kind of a fog of war because you don't know what's out there. So it's very much an exploration game. Um, but it's also a survival game because, like I said, that card deck is your life force. And um, if you draw through all the cards, then you go draw through the deck a second time. When you're playing through the deck the second time, if you draw a curse card, you immediately die and the game's over. It doesn't matter if you've paid like or spent like seven hours playing the game. That's it. Boom. You're dead. Game's finished, which is why some people hate it. <laughs> um, for me, I don't mind because then you just you reset, you play again, you try to beat the curse. I've yet to beat any curse in the game. Mostly because um, I kind of forget what happened in between plays, and I try a new curse every time. Uh, yeah, we'll see. Sleeping Gods might might eventually bump that out because it kind of scratches the same itch. Um, but I, I really like Seven. Yeah, it's good. 
So um, we had two questions that I'm going to bring up. Firstly, have you ever used a pop meat pull sorting tool? Yeah, all the time. Um, I use it every year when I do my top 100s. I've actually had my kids and my friends, I've put all the games that they've played in and sorted out for them so we can see what their top 100 is. Um, and then even recently, like a couple of my, my gamer friends um, have a significant backlog of games. And so we put all of the games that none of us have played yet in there. And we each ran it through the pub needle sorting tool to see which game we want to play the most. And then we combine those three lists. And now we have a, like a <laughs> ranking of this is what we're going to play next time we get together. So we have that kind nice. of sorted out. Uh, right. Yeah. Um, we'll play this ranking sort of your kids and friends. I can do that one in my head. I don't need pub people to help me with that one. That's pretty easy. Um, and your own talk, going back to sort of social deduction, your own says, I've not played those games. Am I missing out? And I mean, it sounds, I don't know you that well, your own. I've seen mm. you in the comments a few times, but if Sates is saying that you're not really into it, I will say that it is quite divisive. There, it is a kind of game where some people just don't like to lie. It is a game yeah. where you're forced to lie if you're at all uncomfortable with lying. If you don't like the idea of saying, okay, are my friends lying to me? And being okay with it at the end, you won't enjoy those games. I remember a true story. One time I messaged someone say, hey, I'm having some people over at my house. Would you like to join in? We're going to play some games about lying to each other. And then they... And then they messaged me a few hours later saying, I'm what are you saying about me? Are you calling me a liar? And I said, no, I'm actually, we are playing some games about lying to each other. And then I um, sent some links over and then they said, oh, wow. Only you would know games like that because this was like an absolute non-gamer who was totally unfamiliar that such games would even exist. But um, have, yeah, you, have, you played, have you played Secrets? Do you know that one? It's yes, by, to kind it's of by Eric Russian Lang and Bruno Fiduti. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have the CIA versus the KGB versus the hippies. Mm. And that's a good one because it's social deduction, but you don't really have to lie. You, you have a token in front of you that shows either your CIA, KGB, or hippies. And you draw two cards. You look at them both. And you try to keep one. You, then you, you throw one of them away. You offer the other one to another player. And they have face down. And they have to decide if they're going to keep it or give it back to you. And before you hand it, you indicate which two cards you drew. So they know the two options. And all of the options have like some kind of positive effect, some kind of negative effect, depending on who gets them and who plays them. And as you're playing, you're just trying to figure out who's on my team and who's not. And you don't really have to talk. You can just you know guess based on what cards people are offering and what they're, what they're keeping and what they're receiving, who you think is on your team and who's not. But the wild part is, is all throughout the game, your token might switch. Like there's cards that, that make you trade tokens with somebody else or close your eyes and someone trades tokens with you. And you don't even know who you traded with or if you got traded out and you're not allowed to look at your token again unless you have certain actions. So um, you might be playing the whole game as KGB. Someone maybe swapped your token out and you don't even know, okay, now am I still KGB? Am I CIA? Am I a hippie? I have no idea. That one I've had a lot of fun with. It's it's a bit of the more chaotic side, but I've really enjoyed that. I mean, if you like, if you enjoy Spyfall, I would say yeah, try out a few more games in the genre. If you're okay with lying, then why not? But yeah, most of them really sing at like six to eight players, though. So that's another mm -hmm. part right now is you have to have a, a decent sized group. Um, I've really my favorite's Bang the Dice game. That's that's in my top ten as well. Um, that one I really like playing. All all the different roles. I'll play every role in that game. I mean, that's another one where, for sure, you've got secret rules, but it's not about lying. It's not about that social deduct. Well, it is about that deduction, but it's not about... I wouldn't... It's a weird one. It's kind of on the cusp of what I would consider social deduction. It's convincing people not to shoot you. <laughs> you know, don't shoot me, shoot the other guy. Well, let's that. move on. And talk about a brilliant thing, brilliant thing. What's a little thing which is brilliant? And unless you've got something else to talk about, do you have something strong in mind for today? I, I never I, asked you. I have, I have a brilliant one, yeah. But for me, it's Okay, easy. let's it's, go for it's, it. It's sunsets. It's nothing really that special. But 
I do get like I mentioned earlier, I have a I get a beautiful sunset out those windows behind me um, every day at like seven thirty, and it's just I just stand there like it never tires me. I get a beautiful sunset every day. That's my beautiful thing. My brilliant that thing. Is lovely. I mean, you say it's a small thing, but no, sunsets appreciates it, and especially if you're on what you said, the fourteenth floor. Wow, you're yep. going to get a good view from there. And I being do, just about every day. Know, sometimes taking that trip, whether it's you know to the top of a local hill if you've got something like that. And Rob says, "Great choice, great choice, Brian." <laughs> Thank you, Rob. There we go. So as we get move more into the proper discussion, feel free to comment, ask questions, thumb like, follow. We are going to get a wee bit more specifically about board game cafes. And from one sure. brilliant thing to another brilliant thing, why are board game cafes brilliant? Uh, they bring people together. That's that's the main reason, right? I just um, one of the main reasons I love games and why I made the game cafe is just to bring people together in an environment where they can chat, meet someone else that you otherwise might never see them, might never meet them. The coffee's amazing too. Can't complain about that. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it's that's it. I just I play games because I want to interact with people, whether it's people I know that are my friends or family, or it's someone new that I've never met before. And I like having that experience and sharing that experience with others. Um, in particular, in the office, you know, um, we have a, a large office that I work at, uh, a couple thousand people, um, and. As I mentioned, we have 750 of them involved in the board game cafe, which means they've shown up, signed up. <laughs> Normally, me walking so up with my computer. That's almost half of the people. Uh, yeah, we're not quite there because the the office is outpacing the growth of the cafe by a little bit, but mostly it's been in the past year, right? Because no one's in oh, the yeah, office yeah, yeah. right now. In the past year, that's yeah. different. In the past, we were typically around 20 percent of the office um, was a member of the board game cafe, which is pretty good. And there's people who join from their first week in the company, right? Um, mm. It doesn't mean that they always show up every week to play, but uh, we normally have between 30 and 50 people show up every week that play games. And it's Friday afternoon is like the dedicated time, but it's actually open 24 seven, even on weekends. Uh, so people could go in anytime they want or they need a break. And I'd see people playing at lunch. We'd, we'd see people playing in the morning, like before work starts, they'd go in early and have a quick game and then start their work day. Um, we even have like a, a borrowing system so that people can take games home with them and play them with their friends and family at home and then bring them back the next week when they're done. Um, but so many connections have been built there where I've seen people meeting teams that they don't otherwise meet. Um, so like, you know, you might need to work with a, a totally different department than what you work with. And you've met someone in that department through the board game cafe and so now you know how to reach out with them and get what you need. So the collaboration that it drives um, is really, really good. Um, that's pretty cool. That is awesome. And yeah, Owen is saying that they're interested in perhaps opening one in their own company. And let's talk a wee bit more about exactly how it is. Like, what's, what are we talking about? How does it work? What kind of coffee machines or drinks? Which, like... <laughs> I know you can't tell us everything about it, but talk us through sure. what the space looks like in as much detail as you can. All right. So my my office has a cafeteria um, or like a canteen. Uh, the food is is there. It's it's provided. So um, that helps a lot, but not necessary. Um, when we built it out, we were moving offices from one office to a new office, and the office was moving more from like a vertical office where we had you know a couple floors in a building to more of a horizontal office where we have um, longer floors. <laughs> it's still, still several floors, but uh, size, everything increased, but everyone's spread out much more. Where before you would interact with people a lot and now you don't because they're spread out. So I wanted to build an area that could get people to come together and hang out and have fun together. And so um, I'm also part of the, like, the culture committee within the office where we basically try to think of you know fun things we can do like employee engagement things like that and i pitched it as an idea because in my previous company i used to bring in my own games and kind of play just with my team like we do it over lunch breaks or something and i thought hey that's something we could potentially scale and so i requested uh some funds from the company i made like a proposal and said this is what i want to do this is why i want to do it um 
and they agreed to it. They even said, hey, this is your dedicated space. Um, we got a couple shelves in there that we put the games on and then just started like internally advertising like crazy. So we got, um, I think we, we got the company to fund about 20 games off the start. And then between myself and a couple other people who I kicked off the idea with, um, I think our starting collection was about 40 games because we brought in some of our own that we were comfortable putting on the shelf and not necessarily worrying about, you know, hey, what happens if this game gets stolen? You know, what happens if someone comes in and, and spills a drink all over all the components? Are we going to care or miss this game? So it's stuff that we felt would be good games, but we weren't so heavily personally attached to. Um, and then we just started advertising, like, you know, putting up signs in the office, um, writing emails out to different, you know, company-wide aliases saying, hey, we're starting a board game cafe, a board game club, and we're meeting every Friday at from four o'clock until six o'clock. Um, I remember my initial goal was to get 100 members of the cafe within six months, and it happened within a month. Like it was just boom, 100 people like signed up over four weeks. Um, and it, yeah, it's just, it just kept going from strength to strength from there. It's, you know, we advertise it. Um, when we start, I'll walk around, I'll look for new faces, um, you know, welcome people, see if anybody's there for the first time. If they are, I ask if they want to join our mailing list. Um, I send out a weekly newsletter, not right now, because it's it's a lot of work. And, you know, without being able to actually play with anybody, there's nothing really to talk about. Like we'd normally have a, a feature game of the week um, where we'd go and set it up early and say, hey, we're going to be teaching this game at 4 p.m. or starting at 4.30 or 5, whatever. So if you'd like to come, come join. Um, and but you know without being able to set up the games or be able to talk about new games that have just uh just entered the cafe there's not really a lot to talk about so i'm not doing the newsletter at the moment so it, you mentioned that you've got these dedicated parts where people jump in and play games as a dedicated games night but you've also got it's open literally all the time where yeah. people can jump in any time and going back to and the food is available, the coffee is there, like the cafe is just, that was already being taken care yeah. of. If you want special food, we can order that though. So we've, we've actually worked out a process that if you want to have like a, um, a, a particular game session there, you can, you know, have people bring in the food. Um, to the question that's popping up, uh, I think it's, is it Johan? Um, there's no, there's no entry fee. There's no membership fee. It's just... You have to be an employee of the company or I guess a friend of, of the of an employee of the company who can bring you in as a guest. Um, but no, people just come and, and play whenever they want. And like I said, they can borrow games as well. Um, we do track what games are borrowed and we, we check them out and check them in. And then we check them in we'll do a light component check. Um, you know, we're not gonna sit there and count every card out of Dominion mm -hmm. or something. Um, but we try to make sure nothing is obviously like damaged or if there's anything very critical to the game that those pieces are there. Um, we haven't really had many issues though. We've had one, one copy of Jaipur got stepped on <laughs> the first day, the first week someone borrowed, it got stepped on and the person offered to buy a new copy, but I'm like, yeah, the box is just squished a little bit. It's okay. Um, um, we haven't really had too many games that have been damaged. And we say as part of the policy, if you're going to take a game home, you're responsible for it and we're gonna check it back in. And if we find that components are missing or you know the game is, is severely damaged, we will ask you to buy a replacement copy. And it hasn't really been a problem. Um, have had a lost component here or there, but normally we've been able to find it. Um, or you know, some publishers are kind enough to offer replacement components as well. And so I'll be very open and honest with them and say, this is exactly what we're doing. You know, I will pay for replacement components, but you know, most cases they've just said, oh, we'll just send it to you. So that's nice. Yeah, there's a lot of generosity in the board game industry. And yeah. Yohan talks about having a similar thing in their own company, but you have to pay each time you go in. And I yeah. think it's a bit... I think it's really cool that a company can appreciate he this is something that's actually going to increase productivity. It talks about people meeting each other. You know, it's a good way to network within the company. Exactly. And, you know, when you've got 
thousands of employees in a single office. That's kind of crazy. And so there's going to be so many people that you've never chatted to. And so maybe it'll be like, hey, I need someone doing this for this project. And hey, wait a minute, that person, I could ask them for. And so... Um, it happened to me. I mean, it, it happened to me exactly that, where I needed something for my role. And I knew people from the cafe that I could reach out to and, and ask. It even helps with things like employee retention. Like I, I know there's one of the people in the cafe who said, hey, I had an offer from another company. And I, I need to be honest with you, Brian. Um, I turned it down because that company doesn't have board games in the office that I can play every week. <laughs> and I want to stay. And so I immediately took that story to HR. Right? I'm like, hey, look at this. Like, you know how much like productivity and money and everything else you lose when an employee leaves the company? We're helping with, with employee retention. And so that was that was pretty well received. That person's still here. It's like been another four years since that story happened, but they never left. I know I know it's that guy from Carcass. <laughs> um some games can be a good jumping board for projects. But yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. I mean, you know, definitely try and get in on your boss. I mean, do you, I will ask, ask forward your question in a moment, John, but do you have any tips for persuading HR or like um, your bosses to kind of actually fund this? If you're one thinking, hey, maybe what we need is just it to be funded by the company rather than people having to pay membership each day. Yeah, what, I mean, I think you have to you have to position it and pitch it as something that brings a value to the company, whether it's like, you know, employee well-being, whether it's engaging with other people. Um, we use it yeah, back to front. All right. Um, we also use it for team building activities. So, you know, a number you can go a lot farther back than I can. I've got a back on my chair. You don't. Um, so if you think like a lot of teams will take employees out right for like an, an employee team bonding night whether it's going out for drinks whether it's going bowling whether it's um you know going to like a cooking class there's things that a lot of teams will do where they'll go externally and expense something like that um with this it's like a permanent feature in the office where you don't have to leave the office so it's very easy to get people to do a team building activity in the cafe itself because you're going to get almost 100 percent of the people to go there because they don't have to travel. The, the farther you make a team building activity, the more the higher of a dropout rate you're gonna go. So mm. it's very, very easy. Say, hey, let's show up at four o'clock. Um, I'll get, you know, they email me and I will email my game gurus and one of us will show up and we will manage the entire event for them, right? Um, we'll, we'll pick out four or five games that we think this group might appeal, that, that might appeal to this group. We'll kind of set them up We'll walk the group through each of those four games and say, hey, these are the four that we thought might be good based on like a little survey we'll send them beforehand. You tell us which one sounds good to you. And they'll say, okay, and they'll pick and they'll say, okay, let's play code names. So then we'll sit down, we'll teach them code names, they'll have fun. And then, hey, do you want to go again? Or do you want to do one of the other games that's set up? And we take it from there. Um, but all of that is at zero cost once you buy the games. And then that's scalable, right? Like in the office, we would normally run two dedicated team activities, team building nights per month. Um, and this is all by request. So we would get at least two requests a month to do this. And then there's also just, you know, we have teams that come every single Friday to play games. And we have individuals who come every Friday to play games. And they would meet, like I said, people that they already know, or, hey, I'm new here. I don't know what's going on. Who can I join? Um, the size of the group. So, you know, two questions in this one, right? One is how many players come every week? Uh, typically between 30 and 50 out of our 750. Um, and it rotates, right? There's there's a core, there's there's 10 people who are there, you know, un unless they've had like a family emergency, they will be there every single Friday to get their gaming fix. And then the other probably 80% of them, you know, flux in and flux out. You have people you see once a month, you have people who show up once, play a game, have fun, but maybe don't come back again. And that's cool. Um, and then you have people who are, you know, semi-regular. We we take surveys on all of this stuff as but well. For so those group we know building our activity, the team building activities, how yeah. many normally come in as a group for those? Um, I've had them go from four up to our highest for an individual event was thirty-five, and so we had a, a large team of thirty-five where we played uh, two rooms and a boom, um, and we did a, a giant group game because that can play 
you know, as many people as, as you have cards for. Um, so we did that with a big group of 35. That was fun. Um, and then we split it up into some smaller groups. Um, yeah. So John asks, do you know which are the most popular games in your cafe? Yeah, sure. So there's a couple different ways to look at this. One is the amounts of times it's been borrowed. So I used to track this and like write it on, on Twitter. Uh, whenever a game would hit, it's been borrowed, meaning taken out of the library um, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 times. Um, for that, the number one game is Codenames. Um, and number four is Codenames Pictures. So Codenames as a series is definitely the most popular. Uh, Sushi Go Party is our next most popular. Sushi Go in general. We have Sushi Go and Sushi Go Party. Um, Sushi Go has the unique distinction of being the most stolen game from our cafe. It's been <laughs> stolen and not returned three times now. Um, however, we actually fixed that. We haven't had any games stolen in about two and a half years, um, which is pretty good. I can walk through that. Um, in the cafe, um, probably the game that's the most popular is one that I doubt anybody here knows unless they're joining from Singapore. It's called uh, the Singapore Dream. Um, it's a little card game that we actually play tested. Um, and it's very popular here in Singapore. It's like 20 bucks. Um, it's a pretty simple card game where you are trying to get like, depending on which character you start with, you're trying to get like a, hundreds of thousands of dollars or collect a certain amount of dreams. And the dreams are all very, very local Singaporean flavored, like, you know, get a job in a certain industry or go to a certain school or eat the most delicious meal at such and such a restaurant. Um, and the game's kind of quirky and funny. Like you play these action cards and you might have to like recite the Singaporean national anthem. Or there's one that's like stand up for Singapore, which is kind of like a like a local, you know, like a local phrase that like the government uses to inspire people, right? Um, and so when someone plays the stand up for Singapore card, everyone has to stand up from the table and whoever's the last one to stand up gets penalized. Um, I think there's even one that you have to do push-ups. Like everyone has to do push-ups until someone can't do them anymore. Um, so <laughs> it's just kind of a weird game. I can't really play it well myself because I'm not Singaporean. So I, I don't know the Singaporean national anthem. So I automatically <laughs> lose whenever that card comes up. Um, but that one does get a lot of play. So, um, yeah, with codes names, I guess looking at what sorts of games work well, you've got the big team games, games that yeah. work well with big groups. I would wonder about Wits and Wagers. If that yeah, we have Wits and Wagers Party Edition, and once a year I run it um, like a game show, like what the Dice Tower does, mm -hmm. where we'll split up into. Um, we have another competition that I run where we 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 divide everyone in the office into one of ten teams, and we kind of do like a, a house cup style competition where teams are trying to get points all year long and there's always a couple board game activities in that and one of them is the wits and wages trivia night so that's a good one um how many people you know, did you get for that uh well i think we did like a it was i think it was about 50 i think we did you had we had 10 teams and you were allowed to have five people per team and so we capped it at that and then we had tables set up in the in the cafeteria we had a big screen and or i think it was a whiteboard maybe and I had a couple of people who were like the showrunners who would run and grab the chits from everyone's tables and run them back up and stick it on the board to show who's voting where. That was pretty good. Um, yeah, that, and then the other thing though is with any kind of cafe like this, if you're gonna build one, um, it's really important that you get a lot of uh, non-gamer games just mm -hmm. games that people are familiar with. I think any game cafe risk, will tell you this. Monopoly. You have to have, we don't actually have Risk because it takes too long. But yeah, we have like four copies of Monopoly, which also takes Wait. too long. Um, yeah, I was going we, to we, say, we, I mean, you don't have Risk because it takes too long. And you yeah, still but, but see, people never play Monopoly right anyway. And I think all of our copies of Monopoly are donated because I haven't wanted to buy one. Um, but, you know, things like Uno, Exploding Kittens is really popular. You have to have, like, Jenga or even a couple copies of Jenga. That was also stolen one time, my personal copy. Um, you have to have games that people who are unfamiliar with board games can walk in, see something off the shelf that they know, and grab it and want to play. Um, because otherwise, it's just it's surprising how unwelcoming the board game community can be if you look at 
a big title of gamer games. People are like, oh, board games, that's so much fun. And they read like 50 titles and see zero that they recognize. It happens all the time. Like, oh my gosh, I don't know any of these games. And then they leave and they don't want to play. So it's important it's that you have- because you're right. I mean, I myself, now when I, I'm at the stage where I'll look at the top 10 or top 50 list and maybe there's two or three that I don't know, to be like, okay, right. that's an opportunity to learn. But for someone yeah. who's like, whoa, I know none of these, that's really bleeping overwhelming. Yeah, and it's bad, right? Because they never come back. They're like, oh, this mm. isn't for me because I don't know what any of these things are. And, you know, we're trying to do it so that we can, you know, build this community and, you know, also personally, selfishly, I want to build a community of gamers, right? Um, and so the only way to get a community of gamers is to have them play a game and enjoy it their first time and then come back. And not everyone who comes in is going to be comfortable or even realize that, hey, if there's any of these games that you don't know, ask one of us and we'll teach you because they, you know, they're not familiar with the concept of a game cafe necessarily or that there are people around who can help. As visible as we try to be, you know, you can't reach everybody. Um, mm. especially if we're all teaching already, right? Um, so yeah, it's, you know, it is good. And it's also really important to, you know, not like, like, you know, sniff badly when someone picks Monopoly off the shelf, right? We have to try to be welcoming and it's, you know, Monopoly gets a lot of hate in the game community, right? Um, but there's so many people who have fond family memories of playing it, right? So you, you want to be inclusive of that, have them play Monopoly, have them enjoy it and then say, oh, you know, if you love Monopoly, um, I can also teach you this. Or, hey, you know, I see you've grabbed Monopoly. Uh, it normally is going to take you four hours. Can I show you something that you can play that's similar to Monopoly, but it'll wrap up in like a half hour or 40 minutes or something like that? Um, and that helps a lot because then, you know, or you can, even you can having a Monopoly in. deal because I. Look. I, I'm not saying Monopoly Deal is a good game. I consider it. <laughs> we have it too. Yeah. Pardon? Yeah, yeah, we have it too. Yeah, but I know what yeah, you're I was going to say. I, but I consider it to. But this is just my personal taste. I'm not saying that. Look, if you love Monopoly, I'm not having a go at you. Personally, for my taste, and you know, I don't know why I'm saying this because I'm fairly sure that everyone watching this is already very much into the board games. But you know, like for me. <sighs> I mean, Mo Monopoly deal, it's a lot better than Monopoly. It's actually a reasonable time length. And then someone who's yeah. coming on will say, oh, at least they recognize that word. And exactly. even though parts of me would love there to be more indie games, you know, giving those smaller games, like mine, you know, a platform. Yeah. But uh, at the same time, people don't know them. So they're not going to go and pick up the box. Whereas if they yeah. see a little box that says Monopoly Deal, then they will at least be open to learning it. Exactly. And I mean, we try to get a really big mix, right? I mean, with 225 games, we've got we've got like every genre covered. We've got, you know, your 10-minute little pickup games like Monopoly Deal. We've got, you know, your mainstream Hasbro. We even have Hungry Hungry Hippos on the shelf, right? Just because someone requested it like three years in a row and we finally <laughs> broke. Um and sometimes we have kids show up too. So it's a great game to have for, for I heard kids someone who bans Hungry Hippos because um, they do a bar thing and they said, yeah, it wasn't that we don't like people enjoying it. It's just that as soon as someone, some people start playing it, all of a sudden the noise takes over the entire space. Yeah, we have music playing in the background. It's all right, but I can see that. For me, it's when the marbles go flying off the table. Um, <laughs> that, that can be a problem. We've had to chase them down, you know, the same with like something like junk art. We've had pieces, you know, go flying off the tables and one like went over the railing and we had to go chase it down somehow. Um, but yeah, you, you know, you need to have, uh, I'm sorry, I do not own Yogi. I only just found out about Yogi um, from the, the podcast with Luke. Um, is this the one with all the backgrounds? That is that Yogi? The, uh, your backdrop, um, all the cards there? So yeah, some of the car. No, some of the cards are from Wibble, which is something that's made. Some of the cards are from Kitty Cataclysm. The most colorful ones, like one finger touching forehead and um, this box on head. And I can see one finger touching hair. And then you've got cards like two hands touching and you still need to manage to draw your next card. 
Uh, so it's basically you, you, like let, you let me know which you let me know which are the ones that I should add to the cafe, and I'm happy if you you let me know how to buy them and get them to Singapore. I'm happy to add them to the cafe. Uh, my pleasure. And then I have to learn how to teach them because, like you said, the hard part is is I mean, uh, getting people is, to pull unknown games off the shelf. That is one I, of the hardest things. I had this realization about a year after I um, published. <sighs> Sorry, this is. I had this realization about a year after I published um, the L deck that, in all honesty, probably I will never make a game that's as easy to teach or as good at bringing people in as Yogi because the rules are literally draw a card, do what it says, everyone does the same going round. Next turn, you've got to draw a card, do what it says, but you are draw always doing everything. If you ever stop doing what it says, you lose. And that is the entire game. And then when I teach it, I don't even talk for that long. I say, okay, draw a card, do what, read it aloud, do what it says. And then they do that. And then I tell the next person. And then when it gets back, I say, okay, you've got to keep doing what it says. And then they get it. And the other nice thing is... I got it already. This, Sounds like it'd be a good um, <laughs> It's like people are big for, at a convention or at a cafe. It draws a crowd. Kind of like um, any dexterity game, but we've got a couple of shout outs. Firstly, Dixit, what's your opinion on that? Uh, we have it in the cafe. I've actually only played it once myself. Um, it is popular. Um, it, get, it gets a decent amount of plays. Yeah, because people know it, right? You always have a couple. We've got, I'd say, 10% of our group is, I guess what you would call like a, a fairly hardcore gamer. I'd say probably another 20 to 30% is um, like gateway, gateway plus, or whatever term you prefer to use, foundation games. Um, they kind of play in that level. And so they would normally know Dixit or like, you know, gamer party games and introduce those to a group it goes over really well. And then I'd say the other 60% or so are people who are brought in by one of the other 40% and they're learning games for the first time. So we do skew a little bit more towards um, the entry level games. Um, yeah, but that's like, sure. we do. So we do have, you know, we we do have the big. They might never have played anything since Risk and Monopoly. Exactly. So we have to appeal to them, and we have a ton of games that do appeal to them. But you know, you you do have to pull it off the shelf and teach it. Okay. Out. Um, let's get your quick thoughts on these, and then I'll move on to some different questions. So, Alex mentioned Skull which has gone down great at one of Alex's work events. The art style is quite striking, but I guess you have to be interested in the game or have someone there yeah. to help with rules. How's it going down at your cafe? I love Skull. I bought it um, during the pandemic with the intent to put it in the cafe. And, you know, I I get to sample all the games before they go in the cafe. So um, this one's still sitting here with another pile of stuff. I fully agree. Um, I played this uh, in Sydney the first time at a game cafe in Sydney. And I loved it. And I just was waiting for it to hit a good price. And it came on Amazon at like half price from what I've ever seen it before in Singapore. It's an authentic copy. So I snatched it up. That's definitely going to go in the cafe. Great choice. Yeah, that is a great game. And if you've not played Skull, again, this is one that sings at maybe four, five, yep. maybe six. Um, how, how many does it go up to? Is it up to six? Yeah, three to six. Yep, three six, to six. But you can combine red and black for bigger groups, I believe. Three to six on the box, um, unless you play the last mission, and then it's only four. Oh, wait, that was the crew. <laughs> uh, and Karuba and other games from Haba, thoughts on those? Karuba, excellent. Um, one of our game gurus has brought it into the cafe to play it before. We do not have a copy right now, unless... It's always on the short list. Like we have, we have a standing list of games that we eventually want to enter the cafe, enter into the cafe. And then when we do fundraising drives, um, normally once a year, I'll ask for a little bit of extra money from the the company. But we also do internal drives within our own membership, where we will ask, you know, hey, if you'd like to donate money to purchase new games, please let us know. And then we kind of set it up like a Kickstarter with stretch goals, and we say, okay, this is the first game we're going to buy. This is the second game, and then here's like a you know, people's choice, something like that. Um, Karuba has been on the list more times than I can count. And it just, it always falls short of getting enough votes. Um, but I love it. I was, I was borrowing it from a friend and playing it with my family here 
Only thing I don't like is the setup time. It takes a while to separate mm. out all the tiles and stack them up. But other than that, it's basically like bingo. It's tiling, bingo, super easy to teach, really fun. That's a good, that's a great call. So we've talked a wee bit about how it was put together. And for you, it's the selfish reason of you're just wanting to play more games, presumably. You aren't getting enough gaming at home. It's a little bit. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe that's part and of it. I mean, look, I'm, I'm one of these people who I, I would play games every night of the week if I could, right? Um, I have a, my my partner is, I would say, gaming tolerant. Um, <laughs> definitely not a game lover, but, um, you know, we'll play games if that's what the rest of the group wants to do. Uh, we have some friends who come over almost every week who both of them really like to play games. We'll have dinner together and then they'll go raid my game cabinet and want to play something. And, um, my partner will, you know, somewhat grudgingly come along, uh, but is always a sport and will always play, even though uh, it's not it's not her favorite hobby in particular. Um, my kids Does will normally play something have once a week. Her favorites? Uh, I, I ran her top 100. Um, Viticulture, I think, was her number one as well. Viticulture mm -hmm. across all four of those people was either the number one or number two for all four wow. of us. Um, Wingspan uh, was a big fan of wingspan that was the one that really like grabbed her at one point and i remember we played wingspan like 11 nights in a row maybe 14 it was either 11 or 14 nights in a row but i remember because i was tweeting about it every night that i'm like oh my god it's two in a row it's three in a row it's four in a row like what's going on with wingspan why is this one so popular and then suddenly like on you know the whatever it was either day 12 or day 15 like eh, i think i'm kind of done with wingspan i don't want to play that one anymore <laughs> And then it's kind of been sitting on the shelf a little bit lonely since I have both expansions for it. Uh, I think we've only played the Oceana expansion once, which I had really high hopes for because we lived in Australia for a couple of years. And I'm like, hey, here's all the Australian birds. Um, but yeah, I think it's only gotten one play. <laughs> and yeah, I guess I think you're on saying that you want to play with more people, even if you are in, even if you were to play games you know, a good few times a week with your partner. Might maybe you just want to play with some other people as well, and it's like, yeah. Uh, I mean, I so I normally um, like in okay. So twenty twenty, we can't really count for any kind of numbers or statistics, right? Uh, for no, for twenty eighteen and for twenty nineteen, I think I played. It was around three hundred games for the year, so pretty much like one a day. It wasn't one a day though, because you have you know your game nights or something like that where you, you pop out a couple, but definitely at least a game a week. Um, I tend to be a bit cult of the new where I like to play a different game. Like whenever, if, if there's a new game on the table versus a game that I know and love, I'll choose the new game every time. Um, like almost every time, unless it's a campaign that I feel compelled to finish. Um, so even like my top games, I haven't played them nearly as much as I'd like to because I'm always getting something new or playing something new or my friends, we tackle that list on their shelf of shame. Um, so that's kind of how I tend to play. Um, Hello Dutch, yeah. lovely Hi, Dutch. to have you jump in. So just talking about this and you know, if you love playing new games, I mean, yeah, I don't want to make this all about the L deck, but you know, maybe you should have a game system there. I'm uh, writing it it. Down, the L but, deck. Um, that's that's different than the L project or Project L, right? Yeah. Um, L deck and Yogi. Yogi sounds like a perfect fit. I'll look them up. Let me. I need. To, do Do you know if they're sold in Singapore? I will have, I have to. to um, Yogi might be sold in Singapore. Um, I think check. I saw it. I think I. It should be. I'll check in with. You'll have to check around. But um, let's talk after the thing. But um, <laughs> I'm imagining, so there's this big cafe, and then you've got this cafe. Oh, yeah, I, here, I see it. I see it. There we go. Yeah, it's so 20 bucks. This thing. Calyx That's in fine. the corner, maybe, I don't know, a five by five Calyx with these 200 games in there. I don't know. Am I, is this roughly what you've got? And then people, it's an open space. It's basically integrated itself into the cafe. People can jump in anytime yeah. they want. But once a week, on, not now, obviously, but normally once a week, people turn up from four o'clock on a particular night 
and yep. then there will be people around to teach them games. And a couple of times a month, you will essentially run internal team building things. Yeah, I'll run internal team building things, and I'll also run contests. So we did a code names tournament. We did a Splendor tournament. Um, we like I, um, we got a couple copies of Ice School from Brain Games uh, to run an Ice School tournament. Unfortunately, they're stuck here in my house. I still have promised Brain Games we will we will run the tournament. Um, so we've done that for like a number of, of games. We do a couple game tournaments a year just to try to get people to play things. Um, the only thing that was wrong is we don't we don't have a calyx. I'm not allowed to have a calyx in the office because they they didn't like the design of it. <laughs> so they they said uh, the office said we will buy shelves that we feel matches the aesthetic of the cafeteria space better. <laughs> so they got the shelves. They're they're fine. They're not they're not as good as a calyx, um, and they're almost full. Uh, but the cool thing is, I almost forgot to mention this. They just opened up um, the the office is expanding. And they've actually opened up a new space in the office. And it's like a new, like it's just a new area. And without telling me, they announced at like an office-wide meeting that they're expanding the game cafe. And they said, we're, get, we're opening a new game cafe space. So now there's gonna be two. Whenever we get the office back to work um, or back in the office, right? We're gonna have the main cafe, which is gonna stay the same with our 225 games. And there's gonna be a new space that we're making the quiet game corner where we're dedicating it to two player games. So that's where we're gonna get, we're getting like Jaipur and you know, that, that's why we bought Jaipur. Um, we went out on like a, a spree to buy a bunch of great two player games. So we got like a second copy of Patchwork and um, uh, Seven Wonders Duel and Codenames Duet and all of those games are going to be going up there. So that's pretty cool. I think, yeah, this is really awesome. And I would like to talk a wee bit more about tournaments. What makes a good tournament? Is it the same thing that makes a good game for the cafe? And how do you make sure that these tournaments are accessible and approachable to everyone? Right. So the first tournament we did was Splendor. Um, and that one, you know, we, we figured out who wants to play Splendor. We did a couple of teaching sessions beforehand. So before the tournament, if you want to come learn Splendor and learn how to play, you do that. Uh, we went to one of the local game stores and we, we begged and pleaded for prizes. It's one of the game stores that we buy games from when we purchase. And they actually had like some Splendor promo stuff that they still had left. So they, they gave us some of the, like the promo shining tiles or something like that. Um, and then we kind of just ran it in one day. Um, when we did code names, we had like a bracket. <laughs> we, we again assigned people from different teams and we would have them schedule out say, hey, you have a game with team whatever. Um, here are the slots available. And then the team captains would discuss and find a slot that works for both of them. And then we had, you know, internal prizes for those. Uh, Ice Cool will run similarly. We're going to do like the big, the double box setup where you can, we'll probably do the race version instead of the traditional Ice Cool because the race is a bit more exciting. Um, we have a copy of Pitch Car. That's going to that's gonna get built out for a tournament at some time. So big games and of course, that like, are fun to just observe even. Do you get a lot yeah, of and, people coming yeah, yeah, by? We, and... Absolutely. We had people watching. We did, um, we did just one. We had a just one tournament where every team had to play just one and kind of score as best as they could. I think we did more than the standard cards. Like I think it's 13 cards in a standard game. I think we did like 21 to make sure that we would have some differences in scores. And you would have the other teams like watching to see what they're doing, see what clues they're using and try to like use that to copy each other. So if they had the same word happen to come up, they would like use the same clues again. So, wow. Pretty good. Um, I want, yeah, we've already talked a wee bit about how it's developed and grown and you've just gotten more games. Have there been any surprises along the way? I mean, you've talked a wee bit about, I don't know if this was before you, we started recording or after, you said, okay, it's me, I do most of the legwork, but I do have a lot of people helping me out. Could you talk about that yeah. the division of labor and everything? Yeah, so I have, um, I think right now it's eight game gurus who help out um, and we have like a game guru email alias that we use. And whenever um, anyone wants to run a team building event, they email that alias and then we'll volunteer and we'll kind of discuss internally and say, hey, who's available? Cause those never run on Fridays. They normally run during the week. 
And so we'll say, hey, who's available this Wednesday from you know 4.30 until 6.30 at night and wants to run this one? And we'll see how many people want to sign up because one guru can normally handle 10 people or so. So if it's a larger team, we might need two gurus assigned. Uh, we'll do that. Um, and then uh, we do check-in and check-outs of games. Um, so they everyone helps with that as well. If someone emails says, hey, I want to borrow this game, then we say, okay, go ahead. Although we're going to shift that to a QR code system once we get back from the office and stick a QR code on every game so that people can check out on their own. And then Monday mornings is typically restocking. So Fridays, by the end of the day, the, the games are kind of all over on the shelves. They're, they're a bit of a mess. And so Monday morning, people come in early and kind of you know straighten up the shelves, uh, see what's come back over the weekend from what's been borrowed, put it back in its proper place on the shelf and mark down that it's been returned. Those are kind of the main things we do. Yeah, there's our there's our non calyx shelves. You found them, um, and this is this is I think the original. Yeah, this is the original photo we had where we had about forty games. So there's you can see a couple of copies of Coup. There's Monopoly, Ticket to Ride is always a good one. Taboo, I should have mentioned that. That's very popular. <laughs> it's a game I I can't stand personally, but wow, that gets a lot of play, and the cards fall out of the box every which way. So it annoys me in more than more ways than one. Yeah, but then you see like Kalis is there and Brass is there, but the old versions of both of those. I, I don't think Brass has ever gotten played in the cafe. Game of Thrones, I know people have taken it out because it's Game of Thrones. And then they like look at the rules and they pack it back up in the box and never play it. And despite um, the dates at which you posted it, this is a very old photo. Yeah, I mean, th that shelf is complete. All the games are turned sideways now. Um, the all the shelves are pretty much full. Uh, we're at the point now where I think we actually have to start culling some games if we're going to try to get more in. Um, yeah, there's my Insta. I think someone asked before if I paint figures. Yes, I do. And so I've been posting them all in different series. Is as my, my unmatched. Unmatched, I love. That's I think that's my number five. And we play test everything for unmatched. Um, for restoration games. So if you're you know wondering about the Marvel series or Battle of Legends Volume 2 or you know, the unannounced stuff, uh, I've played every single deck in existence for Unmatched. It's... And even the ones not in existence yet. <laughs> really cool to sort of see what's going on in this space. And... Yeah, Ron asks, um, have you seen this growing outside of the company? And we already talked about there are more and more board game cafes springing up in Singapore. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's definitely a lot more board game cafes in Singapore. They were around before ours started. Like I said, ours is, is good because it's private and because one of the inhibitors to going to like a public game cafe is you have to get all of your friends to go there with you. You have to pay for it and you different cafes have different vibes right like we have some in singapore that are very much like young university students um we have one or two that are a little bit more like um how do i say like how do i say nicely like a friend more friendly to people that are older than university students <laughs> like just the layout of the cafe or the design you could just say um, more of an more of a middle middle-aged board game cafe um more, of, more, an like, older crowd. Uh, more of an older crowd there you go um but i think more of the older crowd they tend to play in their own homes too because they probably own games they might own their own space they're not playing it like their parents house which a lot of the uni students might be so you don't get the crowd to kind of go out as often to a game cafe um at least not in singapore um some board game stores have some table space and you might see some gaming happening there but you know, I think most of the older crowd, they are playing like, with their own private collections. It's a more limited group. So you miss that social interaction. Um, you know, with what we do, you, you get a much larger group. I mean, so. question is, do you think that running all of this is becoming a bit difficult, a bit tiresome? Or do you see yourself continuing this until you... Retire. I love it. I would do this until until I retire. They kick me out. Like I, <laughs> I kind of joke that I'm the I'm the hang in there kitty. Like I'm just like I don't want to leave the company. I don't want to leave the cafe. Um, so I, I really enjoy doing it. And you know I I'm lucky that I have like managers who are very supportive and just the whole organization is supportive and they know it's what I do. So 
you know, Fridays at 4 p.m., I'm I'm off the clock, right? Everyone knows I'm going to the cafe. No one tries to schedule meetings with me at that time. I, I will decline any ones that are coming because they know that's that's my game cafe time. Um, yeah, it's, it's really good just that it's become a little bit of a like a, a icon in the office. It's its own thing to the fact that yeah, it's an international company that I work for and we have offices all around the world. And I've had you know people from other offices who've come to the cafe who want to play. I've had people who've transferred from other companies, from other branches of the office to ours, who found out about the cafe before they came and joined as a member before they came. Um, even other countries who've sent games to our cafe to put on the shelf, uh, things like that. So it's, um, it's pretty well known uh, internally. Um, and yeah, it's, it's I just love it. it it's nothing I'm going to be um, stopping doing anytime soon. Uh, it is awesome. And I'm glad to hear that it's continuing to be such a source of delight. Now, earlier on, you mentioned that you give each game a cursory glance when you get it back. When people actually borrow games, I'm assuming that it's, is that a free service or yeah. is there like, is it one game per person? Is there something to make sure, okay, no one goes crazy? Is it all just basically an honor system? And lastly, you mentioned that I think you said three copies of Sushi Go got stolen, but then you put in some measures to change that. So how do you, yeah, yeah talk about so, that? So um, there's a couple of things. So first, uh, first question, um, borrowing is free. Um, we do have like a policy that when it's someone who's borrowing from us the first time, we direct them to the policy and make sure they understand that, you know, we will check it out. And if it comes back in bad condition, um, we will charge you for it. Uh, luckily, we've never had to we've never had to do that. Um, we try to cap it at three games per person um, just because we, you know, we want to make sure that it's more likely that they're going to come back. Um, and then we write down, we keep track of everyone who has a game and what games they have. And we give them like two weeks to borrow it. And then after two weeks, we'll start hounding you and start asking you when you're going to bring it back. Um, and most people are very good. They'll, they'll bring it back like that weekend. They normally take something they want to play that weekend and then they bring it back the next Monday. Some people borrow the same game over and over and over again. Eventually, I'm like, hey, would you just like to buy your own? I can tell you where you can get Sushi Go. Um, and other people kind of use it as like their own library, right? Just, I want to try a bunch of games and then they buy the ones they like. And we have gotten tons of sales like not we don't sell games but people who are asking where can i buy this or saying hey i like this so much i bought my own game so it it, it does a lot um sushi go uh so i think the only two games that have gone stolen and never returned were sushi go and jenga jenga was my personal copy that i had from japan that was a bit sad um even though it's jenga i wasn't really playing it anymore but you know it's a, it's a game i i played with my partner at our, our old tiny little apartment with Jap in japan so it has some, uh, you know, some personal connection to it. Mm -hmm. uh, Sushi Go, we didn't even realize it was stolen three times. We thought it was only stolen twice. But one person who had their copy stolen didn't realize that we had replaced it with a different copy. Um, so we found out there were three missing. Um, so first thing we do is we put up, like, like office-wide alerts. <laughs> like, name and shame. Like, Sushi Go is missing from the cafe. We don't know who took it. We'll put like up a like we'll put graphics like with a milk carton with sushi go on the side of it like have you seen me? Um, and normally it's it's someone who just who doesn't realize that they're not allowed to borrow the game without letting someone know. And so most times it just kind of quietly reappears on the shelf without having to do more than that. Um, there actually are security cameras in the office, so once or twice we did have to bring in the security team and say hey. Can you see what happened to this game? And they they saw on the footage, like a person picking the game off the shelf. They could identify who it was and they would just tell me and, hey, how would you like to handle this, Brian? And I would privately message them and be like, hey, by the way, we noticed that you've taken Pandemic off the shelves. Um, you got picked up on the security cameras. Would you like to return that, please? And it's always like, oh, my God, I didn't know. I'm so sorry. Um, one time was a little bit bad where like some games got taken and were defaced to some extent like we have um we have stickers on the games it's a property of the board game cafe and you know please return to whatever and those stickers were like ripped off the box um so it was someone who borrowed the game with the intent to keep it or something happened i don't know um but those came back just in a little bit of damaged condition so since then what we did is there's a thing in singapore where 
there's a, a don't shoplift sign that has like a policeman like holding their hand up and it says like shoplifting is a crime. Okay, so um, we basically made a copy of that without using the actual the actual copy um, because it's a property of the Sing Singapore government. Um, and we made a mock sign of that and we kind of just made a parody of it. And we put up on it, there's a CCTV, like say, you know, you are being watched, so don't steal any games. And we call him Officer Meeple. Um, he's up in the cafe. And, and since Officer Meeple has been on duty, I think we've had zero games go missing, maybe one. And we made a joke out of it by saying, hey, Officer Meeple must have been getting a donut because the game slipped away under his watch. Please return it. And yeah, since then, it's just a, a big sign that people say, don't steal games. We're watching. You can borrow them. Here's how to borrow them properly. And since then, it's been 100% fine. So it's it's the honor system, you know, with, with a sign. That's basically all we need. I mean, everyone's invested in this company. And although I guess once you've got thousands of employees, there's less a little bit less investment to this behemoth. Um, yeah. if, I feel like that's an appropriate word, but still people who enjoy board games, yeah, I mean, that one time when you mentioned them being defaced, that does sound very much like, yeah, the person probably just thought, hey, no one will notice, I can get away with this. And yeah. it had to be the security camera that was, oh, oh wow. Yeah, or I'd like to think maybe they borrowed it and like they had a kid at home and the kid peeled off the sticker because they wanted it to be their own game, maybe, you know. I'm willing to give the benefit of the doubt. All the games came back. Um, you know, they, they didn't have to come back, uh, and they did. So, uh, and like good. I said, we it hasn't been much of a problem. A couple times, but for the fact that, uh, I mean, a lot of people don't know how much games cost, right? Let's be honest. Mm. Um, there's thousands of dollars on well, the, the shelf. The weird thing is that... In my collection in London, you know, I've got a couple of games that it's like, you know what, these cost literally two quid or three quid, and I don't care about them, probably no one cares about them. They were literally three quid brand new and um, yeah. from the works, and, you know, there's another game right beside it that cost me 200 quid, which is my... Well, it's actually two games I've got that are pretty expensive. One is Fireball Island. One hey, is right Codex. above me. Right above me. <laughs> Codex. Uh, that's a good one. Yeah, Codex is. That's hard to get. That's out of print, right? Um, hard price enough. Possibly. I mean, I wasn't. If it is, it might be more than I paid for it. I got the all-in Kickstarter. So I was like, oh, yeah, okay, I, okay. not not properly all-in. It was all-in with regards to play material. So I didn't get the, like, player mats. You don't need player mats. Come on, people. I mean, okay, you can have player mats. If you really want your player mats, go ahead. But you don't... What, once you, don't, you have one, you don't... As long as you got one, you can use it for any game. Just flip it over. <laughs> so. <laughs> anyway, we're not here to player mat shame. What I want to ask you is, like, firstly, are there any suggestions or lessons for potential game club organizers? I mean, it sounds to me like it's just all you need to sell your bosses on is having some shelves in the cafe. Ultimately, if there's already a cafe, just as long as they're willing to put some shelves up. But secondly, um, once we've talked about that a wee bit, I'd like to ask if you've got any tips for designers like myself who might be thinking, okay, any... Mm. things that you've realized about making games more accessible to a crowd and easier to teach short rule books <laughs> like something if, if for a board game cafe right um specifically for a board game cafe it has to be something you can pull off a shelf flick through the rule book and teach and play as you go there's very few games like that and yogi sounds like one of them which is why i'm excited to pick up a copy of it i'll, I'll I'll do it by the end of the week, I promise. So you're gonna, hopefully you still get some commissions on those. I don't know how it works on the design side, if you if you still get royalties or whatever, but that'd be good if you do. Um, like some game, if, if that's the audience you're targeting, right? You want it to be something that you can open the rule book, flip through pretty easily, make sure that, um, you know, the rules aren't like super mechanic heavy, like in use terms that people can understand when they're reading it. Like, you know, it's, if you have a deck building game, most people don't know what deck building is, right? But I have um, Abandon All Artichokes, which I picked up um, 
I picked it up for the cafe, but I think I might keep it for myself and then pick up another copy for the cafe because that game is like Sushi Go, like distilled down drafting to like its mm. purest essence, right? Abandon All Artichokes is the exact same thing for deck building. Although right? it's you worth actually... noting, like I, I've not played this myself, but I've read up on it, Genius Design by Emma Larkins, but um, yep. yeah, it's more of a deck deconstruction game where what you're trying to do is to draw a hand, get rid of your artichokes, so you draw a hand yes. and you've got no artichokes in them. Yeah, you're right, but you don't, you, you don't, you start with all artichokes and there is no play five cards, see how much currency you get, buy a card from the market. It's, you have the market, you just pick a card from the market, take it. And now you have a deck of artichokes plus one card that's not an artichoke. And you can use those cards to trash some of your artichokes. And that's it. You just keep adding cards to your deck and vetting out the artichokes as you go. But once you've learned that, it's much, much easier to pick up something like a Dominion or you know a Clank or any other kind of deck building game. But that is just, it's exactly that. Um, game rights killing it with these kinds of games right now. Like Go Nuts for Donuts, mm. that's another one I'm going to put in the cafe. It's, it's basically a bidding game that's super simple, right? You just... You put out five donuts, you pick a number one through five, which donut do you want to take? You put it down. If you're the only one who put down that number, the donut's yours and you score some points. If two people pick the same donut, it goes in the trash. That's it, right? Um, I guess because everyone put their grubby fingers all over it. No one wants to eat it after that. <laughs> um, but you know, a, a simple game like that is is really good for the cafe because um, you know they, they help grow up to the next one. Um, but the difficult part, and it's one thing that we have to reconsider when we eventually reopen is how do you separate those games? It's more organizing, right? How do you say this is a game that's pick up and learn on your own? You'll learn it in five minutes. This is a game that you probably want to learn before you come play it. This is a game you're best off if we teach it. New York Pizza, yes, we have it on the shelf. Um, you know, that's a, a game that you want to someone's going to have to walk you through it and it's going to be a time commitment we use a bit of a sticker system for that right now where we do have like a red green yellow stickers, green sticker it's really simple red stickers okay you probably want to have played a few games before this like i yep. wouldn't advise yep. anyone play Kalis if they've not already played it no that's that's red sticker <laughs> red sticker and we even put a an ryg on them as well uh to help with color blindness so we try to maintain the accessibility Ooh. there so nice. red, yellow, green sticker with, with R, so Y, and G. So R, Y, or G in black on yeah. top of it. And we even have a blue plays too. So we have two player games labeled with a, a blue sticker with the number two written on it. Um, so those will be your games that are specifically designated for two players because we do have um, people who come for that as well. I guess the next thing would be like a sticker for, I don't know, nine or more, or maybe eight or more. What's yeah. Different? We always, we always, that's one of the more difficult things. And I, I do go into other game cafes. And I try to see how they organize games. It can be really tricky. Like originally we just had everything alphabetized and then we divided it by player count with stickers. And now player count with stickers is still a bit weird because of our shelves. They don't like, you can't really clearly have like a two player shelf and a four player shelf. Plus the amount of games we have in each of those player counts is weird. And then you have seven wonders where where the heck do you put that? It plays like three to seven. So it doesn't fit in the four player spot. doesn't fit in eight plus. It's like, it could be anywhere. So we're probably going to divide it next time by like genre hmm. or, you know, genre or weight one or the other. We haven't really decided yet because people might come in and say, oh, I want to play, you know, a cooperative game or I want to play a competitive game. But this is one of the more difficult things for us is figuring out how to organize the game on the shelf so they're easy to find what you're looking for. You can quickly understand what kind of game you might want to grab, especially for people who are grabbing games on their own. I mean, a quick shout out to Drafts, where I worked for just over a month. Um, so disclaimer of bias. But I did quite like the fact that, yeah, it's broadly separated by categories, but those categories are also kind of weight. So, okay, all the old classics, which basically means Scrabble, Monopoly, Risk, are in here. Yeah. All the... Um, there is enough two-player games to have the two-player games get its own section because lots of... All the co-op games here, and then there are, I think, three more sections. One for heavy, you know, Euro games. One for party games, and then a tiny yeah. little one for 
okay, here are the staff number one recommendations. And the staff recommendations right. were meant to be things that, okay, we can actually teach it because it takes 30 seconds or less to teach. Um, yeah. Maybe a minute like, or two, given that they're going to be asking you things. And so, but, you know, under optimal conditions, you should be able to teach these games within 30 seconds. And you can, you know that it's going to appeal to a broad number of people and are super accessible and they're there as the first jumping on point. Hey, if you've yeah. never played Ghost Blitz before, then you probably want to give it a go. If you've never played Yogi before, well, if you don't like Contortion, then don't, you know, you kind of know what you're getting into just based on the box. But yeah, and so I think that's having this sort of thing. Hello, Nicholas, we're getting towards wrapping up, but it's lovely to have you here, lots of love. And Yuhon asks, do you have games for the blind? Which reminds me, I don't know if you know Excessive, which is a French company that's yeah. actually modified. Um, it might be worth checking them up. I'm going to Excessive, spelt like um, that, I believe. So if you check them out, they do things one. like having um, for Quarto, they have little hairbands or no little hairbands, depending on whether it's black or white. So once you've got that, boom, everything else is clear. And you've got little words games where the actual word letter itself is, um, I think, yeah, it's with a game called Tutelix. And there was, I, I, I'm not going to get into the politics behind that. There was some interpersonal politics that isn't, anyway, sure. there was some a bit sort of aggravation, but um, they've got a bumpy letter. They've got like, you know, we mm. custom versions, but yeah. The only yeah, we, we don't have any for the, the only one I know for the blind is uh, Nyctophobia, maybe, which I think mm. the designer created it because some member of her family was visually impaired in some way yep. and 100%. wanted a game. And that's when it's like tactile, right? I've never played it myself, mm -hmm. but I, I know of it. I really want to, like, to play that. Yeah, Catherine Stapel. Well, yeah. a murderer like chasing you in a forest, and you have to like one person feel, has to be able to see. Apart. No one else has to be able to see. Right. Right, something like that. And you have to feel your way through like this forest and escape the murder. Um, seems cool. I wish you didn't the have like a bloody axe on the cover. The game that I it's... know other than that, that is quite playable, that I used to play with a friend who's now sadly passed away, rest in peace, Cherry. But um, this friend, we used to play Last Word. I don't know if you know it. We modified the rules very slightly, but it's a big buzzer. You've got... Um, letters you kind of say okay that's the letter that you're trying to get that's the thing in front of you and you say what everyone else has got in front of them okay now we're going to um flip over the central card it is a j and then you click the buzzer and then um, mm -hmm. cherry would be you know shouting things and able to engage as well as anyone and then the buzzer the really interesting thing is there's a little computer inside this buzzer so it doesn't buzz after a definite number of seconds it's randomized so you don't know whether it's going to last five seconds or 30 seconds or 20 no, cool. or whatever. And then it's the person who says the last word before the buzzer goes. So you just want to be constantly shouting things. Makes sense. I really wish they would do like spy fall in Braille because I think that would mm. be a wonderful game. There's the 64 ounce games. I don't know if you know them. But if they, if they could just publish like even just a deck of like a, you know, if you could buy it as a promo or something. Just a, a braille version of Spyfall because that's one we've played at you know a lot where you don't even need a table right. I've played it in people's living rooms where you just sit around anywhere. You just kind of pass the cards out and everyone's just shouting the questions at each other. I someone correct me if I'm wrong about this, but sixty four ounce games I believe is an American company that they do braille conversion kits or mm. um, not braille but like tactile conversion kits for our cards which is really cool. Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, I mean, that's it's one of the parts of the, the board game community that's really hard to deal with, right? Um, there's not a lot of good games. It's very hard to find a way to make games accessible to people who are visually impaired. We have a couple mm. of people um, in the office who do have some physical um, some physical impairments or some physical disabilities that you know, we are able to, to play a lot of our games with them, which is nice to see. Um, you know, there are some though where you, you do have to be a, a little bit 
more careful about which ones you choose because it might not be as easy to reach across the board or you might need to you know move around the table a lot so um but we we do we do try to pay attention to that as well oh i do realize that i did miss um a question earlier where you go and asked about why you don't set up a board game shop so you can actually sell the games i'm imagining that's just because of the additional hassle and work involved yeah i think um it's it's quite competitive here in Singapore as well. The, it's a smallish community, right? It's five five million people in Singapore. So, and I, I could probably name five ten game shops off the top of my head. Um, so I don't think that there's much of a market to do it. Um, and I'm quite confident that at least for a while I wouldn't make as much money running a game store or cafe versus what I make in my current salary. So this is a good mm. balance for me, right? I have a stable oh, job that I don't have to And the question was regarding ever. within the company, like why you don't um, have a shop within the company, but I'm guessing... Oh, uh, we're, not allowed. So we're cool. not allowed. We're not allowed. We're not allowed to sell anything within the company to other employees. We've checked on it. Okay. And so the final question before I start wrapping up, unless if anyone has any questions, make them super, super quick because I want to be respectful all the time. But I tend to ramble. <laughs> what are one or two of the biggest moments that you can remember in the cafe's history? Um, if there's anything else you would like I to mean, share. Personally, when, when Eric came, that was that was amazing, right? <laughs> that was just a huge memory for, and it was all of the game gurus were there for it. So that was great. Um, we had um, one of the, like one of the very, very most senior top people in the company, who's our, our head of legal, like our global head of all the lawyers, uh, who shows up quite regularly in everyone's inbox, um, played code names at the cafe. <laughs> so came came on an overseas trip to Singapore and showed up. So we have a photo of, of that person um, playing a game in the cafe. Um, and then I think a lot of the playtesting. So we've had a number of games that we've playtested in the cafe that have come out um, or that are coming out soon, ones that you know we were involved in the development of the playtesting and now they're on our shelf. Uh, the one I'm most excited about is definitely Return to Dark Tower. Um, I don't know if any of you backed that on Kickstarter. Um, if you did, I was extremely active in the comments section. So my avatar is a little uh, meeple with the Singapore flag on it. And if you go into the, the comments section there, I was working like a long, volunteering. I wasn't working because you know, it was just for fun on my end, but working with uh, the whole crew at Restoration Games to kind of answer, there you go, to answer questions overnight. So when they would go to bed, I would be moderating the comment section for the Kickstarter for the evening and kind of handling everything because we'd done a ton of playtesting for Return to Dark Tower, which is one of my favorite games when I was a kid, the original. And um, they're kind enough to, they're sending us like a full all-in pledge for us to put onto the cafe shelves. Uh, when that comes out as a as a thank you for the play testing and for the uh, comment section moderating that we did. So that's that's a good one. That is awesome. And so, yeah, I think that this is a good time for me to officially recap and wrap up. We have talked about quite a bit today. We've talked about your love of recently yeah. Clank Legacy and Sleeping Gods. We've talked about a bit of aggravation of the crew. I mean, <laughs> News brought to us by Xate that level 32 is unplayable. I mean, I, yeah, I'm very curious once it's in English, I will read this myself. I'm, that is incredibly disappointing, if that's correct. But that the final level not playable by two or three. And we talked about having this big 14th floor sunset. We talked about <laughs> um, meeting Dark, up dark with, here. Conan O'Brien or Charlie Ferron. We talked about Mooncake Master, um, Red Rising, Eric Lang coming over to play Blood Rage and donate a couple of games, playing a Sydney vineyard, Viticulture, <laughs> and Seventh Continent, a game that's apparently you've still not managed to beat. <laughs> but checking out things on Pop Meeples and and um, talking about secrets and other social deduction games. We've talked about basically starting off just bringing a game into the office, saying, okay, I want to bring people together, have a wee bit of a team building thing, then thinking, hmm, maybe I could do this on a bigger scale. 
And continuing to do those team building things with like up to 35 people on request got talked about particularly good games that we talked about code name sushi go the singaporean dream which you know probably ties into yeah if you are based in london why not have a couple of games that are about london or if you are based yeah. in yeah and it doesn't have to be to be the british not, dream <laughs> yeah we talked about having Whitson's wagers with 50 people, ways to avoid thefts, just having a little police meeple and, you know, but telling, explaining to people, educating people. We talked about keeping it simple, whether it's Uno or Jenga, but like making it something that you can really teach easily with short rule books. We talked about wingspan tournaments, about ice school tournaments that will be coming up in the future, about letting people just get together and play and having a good time. We talked about being a wee bit frustrated that maybe you can't play as much as you would like at home. And we talked about games that you can teach as you go. And so maybe rule books that you don't need to get to the end. The rule book gives you enough information for the first to get started. Okay, now the rule book gives you enough information for the first turn. And now the rule book tells you how to score, like telling you as much as you need at, at those points, I guess. Um, talk gave a shout out to abandon all artsy chokes which i still really need to play sorry emma but um about go nuts for donuts about accessibility about 64 ounce games and accessibility issue and about um catherine's to nixophobia and about getting to play test some games that came out like return to dark tower and so it has been such a good chat and thank you so much for it no thank if you it's been it's been a pleasure if people would like to check me out, then of course they can check out stuffbybez.com, which is my main website. Stuffbybez.bigcards.com to buy print and play stuff. Twitter.com slash stuffbybez for all the tweets. Instagram.com slash stuffbybez for some pictures. Twitch.tv slash stuffbybez where I'm streaming every day for the next 80 days at 10 a.m. UK time. YouTube.com slash stuffbybez for all the episodes. And if you want to join a Discord and share thoughts about games or maybe join in a game jam or some sort of game playing or hear about events and share pictures of cats because I do have some pictures, some very freaky drawings of cats. I am going to go out on a limb and say that I probably have the freakiest drawings of cats around and someone can, <laughs> I'm going to make that claim. I know it's very subjective, but I am going to, I've got already two freaky pictures of cats which people had, Idol Michael was quite horrified by. So I take that as a badge of pride. <laughs> and if you want to check out Brian, where do you most like to be found? I mean, do you like uh, people if you to want, stop If you want to chat with me, Singapore? chat with me. On, yeah, that's, that's great. If you want to chat with me, uh, love to engage in conversations on Twitter. That I use mostly talking about the cafe itself, although not as much recently. Um, my Instagram is also Office Game Cafe. I've just started that recently, only broken 100 followers so far. Um, and I'm mostly posting photos of games as well as photos of the minis that I paint on there. And so, yes, definitely be sure to follow Brian on both those things if you tend to follow people on those things. And, and if you show up in Singapore and I know you and our office is back open, you can give me a ping. And I could probably let you in for a free round at the Game Cafe. It's a pretty cool offer. So, um, but you can't host an international convention. I can't convention. host yet. I can't host an international convention. That's not going to happen. No. Mm -mm. Right now, you I don't even to... think you can fly into Singapore that easily. So you gotta. No, no, maybe I wasn't meaning right, right now. I was meaning with us. like the whole things that we were talking about with you and. Um, oh, no, I don't Calvin think I can let in that like... many people at once. <laughs> I can let yeah. you in, Baz. I can let yeah, it in one like or one two people at a time. time. It's one at a yep. time. Exactly. So, yeah, we a need to get a, a different convention. thing going on, whether that's in Malaysia, whether that's going on in Thailand, get something in that part of the world. Um, thank you for listening in during your lurk. Thank you for that. And it's been lovely to have you here. Um, I want to say thank you, everyone. Obviously, thank you, Brian, and thank hey, yes. you all the commenters and everyone who's lurking as well and just enjoying this and soaking this up and not feeling a wee bit shy. 
but I hope you have had a wonderful time. And this is a final question from me to anyone watching where I bring it back to you. And I ask, what are you up to? Over to you, what are you up to? You can share anything you want to, but it's only if you want to. Because if you want to, you can share something that you're dreading doing and you want to be held accountable to it, or something that you're looking forward to doing, or something that you're excited about, or if it's boring, or serious, or frivolous, however it is, share something. I am going to share that uh, tomorrow. Um, Dina is going to be, well, Dina's already started up a new Instagram for me, which is Categoric L, but there's a dot between, actually, I should probably type that up in the comments, but that's going to start tomorrow, so I'm quite excited about that. Um, other than that, I don't really have any specific plans for today. This is, I say, this is slightly sad. I'll probably do a wee bit of writing, but again, I'm not feeling 100%. I'm going to be taking it a wee bit easy, being kind to myself, and going on a wee bit of a walk later on. That's what I'm going to be up to. How about everyone else? In chat, what are you up to? Brian, what are you up to? Uh, I'm going to have dinner. I think my kids have already eaten, and then i got to put them down to bed in about a half hour or so. <laughs> and... Rowan is cleaning the basement. Um, thank you for being here, Rob. Lots of love. Um, Nicholas says, we'll catch the beginning later. Yep, if you want to check it out, it will be on YouTube. Um, possibly now. Like, I think the link should work already. But from my main page, it takes a couple of hours before it's accessible from the main page. There's a chance that Alex will be playtesting Kingmaker again tonight and relearning Vassal in the process. Otherwise, who knows? Oh, and that sounds amazing, oh. Rob. Talking about vaccines and pandemics, um, I do want to give, let me move on to my, personally, what am I up to for my future streams? As of always, check that out. Tomorrow morning, I am going to meet up with Alan Paul and Rita Modal and maybe Matthew Dunstan because for, yeah, Matthew is generally okay, but might not be healthy enough to join. So lots of love to Matthew Dunstan and wishing a speedy recovery there. And we'll see how it goes on tomorrow. Tomorrow evening, we'll be playing Balanceable at 8pm UK time. Wednesday is a discussion group with all sorts of people who've worked on game books. We'll be doing that. Thursday, meeting Oliver Akina from Board Games Blog. Friday is Shenanigans. Saturday is with Dutch Yoda. Um... Sunday, I'll be reviewing Quintuple, and next Monday, I will be meeting Kirsten Lunde, which I'm quite excited about, um, who's making a musical-themed game. But yeah, that was just my quick thing. So lots of love and good positive vibes to Matthew Dunstan. So um, if anyone has any more things to say... Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everyone's congratulating Rob for getting the vaccine. I mean, it's more, it's a weird thing because um, in... Yeah, it's like, congratulations, glad you're getting one, wish I had mine. It's one of those, right? <laughs> it's more like um, good times, that's really what you mean. Like, it's like, yeah, yeah. good times, Rob, that sounds awesome. But no, I know what you mean, it's like, um, because... Yeah, English it has this weirdness in there for sure. But yeah, anyway, if this was interesting for you, feel free to share it. If any of the future things seem interesting, feel free to share them. Oh, I was going to, um, sorry about this. I will get my Instagram of Categoric L. I will just paste that very quickly in the comments for people to follow that as well if they fancy. That is not going to be posting very much. That's going to only be posting twice a week. So it's not going to be too much at all. Um, and yeah, that brings me to the end. If you're watching on Twitch, then we are going to be raiding. We... Oh, wait, it's a Monday. That's why Idol Michael isn't... Life. I was like, hey, wait a minute, why is Idol Michael not playing? Um, oh, 
Cleo Llewellyn's playing. Oh my gosh. Definitely reading Cleo Llewellyn. Well, where I also moderate, so I'm biased, but Cleo Llewellyn I um, was listening and when they were just starting up, they're such a lovely person and play amazing music, UK based, copy paste some or all of that message. And yep, Rob, of course, we all hope that the side effects are incredibly negligible. <laughs> Is there anything else that you feel we need to mention? No, just thank you for having me here. It's It's been a lot of fun. Well, that brings me to bye, 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 bye. This is a goodbye song. Bye, 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 bye. bye Thank bye. you for watching along. Bye, bye, <laughs> bye, bye. This is the end of the show. Bye, 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 bye. And now it's time to go. Do -do -do -do. Bye, 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 bye. This is a goodbye song. Bye, 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 bye. Thank you for watching along. Bye, 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 bye. This is the end of the show. <laughs> bye, 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 bye. And <laughs> now <laughs> it's time to go. Bye-bye. Oh. Yeah, have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Now we're just going to sit here for five seconds. That's it. Bye-bye. <laughs> Silence. Mm. Yeah. This is, you know, what the whole stream has been leading up to, me staring awkwardly at you. Bye-bye. <laughs> mm. Right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do I just leave now or do we go offline? <laughs> um I will end the broadcast in a second. Okay.